Good afternoon, all. So pleased to have Joanne Rido, a leading expert in the field of satellite regulation and commercial contracts, join us for a talk titled Journey into Space. Joanne is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and the Royal Aeronautical Society, trustee of the National Space Center and chair of the National Space Academy Steering Board. Joanne, I'm here to help you with the Q&A session after your talk. Any other issues that might require assistance? I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Neha. Um, thank you to all the organizers for this tremendous conference, to all the attendees for being here, and a huge thank you to Rika in the background, who's been a phenomenal help to me um, in, in regards to technology. So thank you, thank you. It's a fantastic team, of course. Um, so in the next 15 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about my journey into space law, starting out, getting involved, building a space practice, uh, when nothing existed beforehand. Um, some of the highlights that I've had in almost 30 years now in space law and some reflections. But first of all, starting out, I was the first in my family to go to university. My mother was very keen to study chemistry at university but wasn't able to, had to join the family of bakery. So I very much felt that I was flying the flag for women in my family. I started out at the University of Aberdeen and um, studying law and economics. I met a brilliant professor, Niall, who I'm still in touch with weekly, um, and who chose me to attend the first ever European Centre of Space Law course for two weeks in Messina. And I got the space bug. I fell badly, but I was already fascinated with space um, from the age of nine. My father was a printer, and he brought me home this book when I was age nine, the Encyclopedia of Astronomy. And at weekends, I used to go up to Edinburgh Observatory, uh, I come from Edinburgh, so I'm also privileged to be here for the, the Edinburgh Women in Space. Um, but that, that was the big change for me, the European Centre of Space Law. I then went to study at Oxford and spent one month convincing professors there that I wanted to do my thesis in a two-year MPhil course on the economic analysis of intellectual property around Earth observation missions. And after a month, they pretty much gave in after some perseverance. Um, I then tutored for the European Centre of Space Law for about four years. They're just a fantastic bunch of people, and it's Marco Ferrazzani that's speaking there, who's still there 20-something years on. He's brilliant. Um, and I studied private practice in Scotland and then in England. I'm qualified in both. But it was quite clear after a few years of private practice that I needed to really boost my knowledge of telecoms um, and spectrum. Um, so Joan? Hello? So sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Um, I'll try to, yes. So I did a, a two years uh, master's thesis on our telecoms at the Queen Mary University of London. And to, to really boost that, I, I felt that there was a gap there. And then I was approached by the European Space Agency for a rare legal job and went there and was one of the few space believers at uh, the European Space Agency. And I was very privileged to also attend and represent them and the UK at the Committee on Peaceful Uses Case at the UN. So when I was trying to come back to, to London from Paris and the um, ANISA, law firms did not take me seriously. They did not take space seriously at all. Um, they thought space was irrelevant to private practice of law in, in London and elsewhere. So I took a job in Ofcom, which was actually, in retrospect, a fantastic Thing to do. I wrote the procedures for management of satellite filings there and um, really got my head around spectrum and space spectrum. So actually in retrospect that was fantastic and once I was in Ofcom I was then able to get a job in, in private practice. But space was my chosen subject. I threw myself then, heart and soul, uh, learn, learn, engage, collaborate and include and tutor for ECSL and I chaired the National Point of Contact. I joined the Standards Committee for Space and Space Debris, um, the only woman 20 years ago and still the only woman there. So I'd encourage other people to join. I, I chaired the first woman to chair the International Bar Association Space Committee and first to stay for two years doing that. Set up the Satellite Finance Network uh, 13 years ago to try and bridge the gap between the city and, and the finance and small space companies because they just didn't speak the same language, very, very different. 
um, I've been trying to solve regulatory issues, seeing gaps and trying to solve them, and we've managed to change insurance policy twice, and we're trying again. And I currently co-chair the regulatory advisory group and the launch industry group with the space agency and a really great team at the space agency. I lecture with, with the International Space University and some other universities, and I write a column now in via satellite, and they're great to work with because they let me write on anything I want. So um, I've written on modern slavery, human trafficking, the Ebola outbreak, and really pushing the envelope on space applications. But all of this time, I was trying to build up a space law practice. I believed that people would need to understand space law contracts, etc., but nothing existed. And quite honestly, um, I saw the potential of the space law practice, but the firms didn't. Uh, space did not generate immediate revenues. It was difficult, it was complex, it was academic, it was too international. Now, I did the business plans, I took into the, I have to say, the male partners, um, I did the industry analysis, and I got laughed at. I really got laughed at. Scott and me and Alan Lovery were different, actually. They did take it seriously. But the mistake I made in, the, the, in, in, in law is that I had fallen in love who can and sink for it with space and space law? And I took it personally and cared. I wanted to understand the technology, the business plans, the client objectives, the industry. I didn't just want to make a fast buck for the senior partner. I'm sorry to be so bold, but it's true. And slowly, the, the clients were beginning to agree with me. Um, they didn't want the big law firms who they had to educate. And I had the same experience at ESA, educating a very big law firm and then actually giving up and bringing the work back. Um, they wanted people who actually understood their business plans, how the board worked. They needed people who understood the industry. So um, they really encouraged me to set up Alden, Alden Legal. It took me two years to build up the confidence, actually, to be honest, to, to set up Alden Legal. And one big motivating factor was I have three girls, and I wanted to be a role model for them to embrace affect and implement opportunities and my mum and the parents in law were phenomenally supportive. And guess what? The clients followed and they brought friends and the clients have been phenomenal supportive, just brilliant. But I won't say just um and they completely got it uh, and that advice directly to their board level. So um it's been brilliant and that engagement has only increased. So what is this strange subject of, of space law? I'm not going to give you a legal lecture here, but I just want to, well, well, one mention why I was so motivated by this subject. And Professor Lyle taught me many years ago that 1967 was the height of the Cold War. There were so many terrestrial tensions, particularly between the US and Russia, et cetera. And the space treaty was fundamentally a disarmament treaty but it was also an international relations achievement. States put away terrestrial differences and agreed on something bigger than them, looking at the future, the potential of space. And this absolutely motivated me. The states could put away the terrestrial differences and look at something bigger than them. This was a pretty amazing subject. And there are only four words you need to know in regard to space. So one is responsibility. States have international responsibility for private and public activities, and they need to authorize and supervise them. Secondly, liability. If um, a state launches, procures launch, or if something is launched from a territory or facility of the state, that state has international liability for that object or any damage that it causes. And once a launching state, always a launching state. You can't remove that. That's ad infinitum. And then lastly, two other words, jurisdiction and control. States retain jurisdiction and control over objects they put on their national registry. And that's like ownership. And ownership of objects doesn't change whether they're in space or back down to earth. Um, and then just two other things. States are absolutely liable in regard to damage on earth, to aircraft in flight or in uh, territorial waters. So that's, that means you don't need to prove fault. In space, you do need to prove fault, and that's partly why we have the registration convention. You need to identify objects and you need to prove fault. But fault is pretty difficult to prove when there, um, because you need a regulation or law against which you prove fault, and there are very, very few of them. 
So that's all between states. And states want to pass some of that loss and responsibility and liability down to private operators who can best bear and mitigate that loss. And they do so by national laws, licensing and licensing conditions, as you can see here. And the UK have, have two pretty um, thought leading uh, le um, acts there, the Outer Space Act and the Space Industry Act. And we are seeing in the last few years more national laws and regulations than we have ever seen before. Why? Well, one reason is, yes, it's the flow down of that liability and responsibility down to or universities and private operators, but it's also a stamp of recognition, a stamp of international credibility. We've got a space law, we've got regulations, we take this seriously. And thirdly, states are now waking up to the fact that actually there's money to be made and jobs to be made in regards to space law. And they're, they, they're using their laws and regulations to attract foreign direct investment and encourage employment and economic growth. Some of the current issues that are keeping me busy, really important ones, sustainability of space act activities, access to spectrum, which is a scarce resource, and we're seeing more congestion and more competition there. Close proximity missions, small launchers, spaceport and range, including and especially from the UK, um, large constellations, EO high resolution hyperspectral imaging, and national policies more than ever before. That stands for approval. I'm just going to very briefly touch on three of these issues to show the type of work that I would do. First of all, large constellations. I would do the contracts, the licensing, the spectrum, whether they've brought into use or not, and even lawful intercept requirements. And I sit in the middle of pretty much the opportunities and the threats to actually come up with solutions to make these opportunities possible. That global internet coverage, that promotion of R&D, that encouraging of access to outer space and the societal benefits of bringing broadband internet to the other five billion, etc. Um, but the threats of, yes, there is a rise of collision and liability. There are issues in regard to spectrum interference, ITU coordination difficulties, dark skies and sustainable use. And what I do is I sit in the middle of that to make sure that we get the most of these opportunities, but we keep um, it compliant with national laws, regulations and, and, international, um, and international relations. Space debris. All man-made objects, including fragments, etc., mostly post-mission breakups and mission-related debris. And as a result of new activities, yes, there's a growing amount of space debris, but it's also caused, let's be really blunt about this, by irresponsible behavior. And this is a really important issue. One small piece of debris, even a fleck of paint, can cause real loss or damage to satellites, and that would have implications to us down on the ground. And what we're worried about is that cascade effect, that Kessler syndrome, which could limit the long-term exploitation of outer space. And this is a real issue, whether we like it or not, we need to grapple with this. And one big issue in this regard is, yes, we have guidelines, and yes, we have standards, and they are the blue triangle at the top, but they're non-binding. There are voluntary standards. So you, you ask how many states have actually implemented them or how are they implemented? Now, they're only binding if they're called into space agencies' policies, called into contracts, or applied into national laws, regulation, and licensing frameworks. But until they are, they're not binding. So we need to look at making them binding, applying them in international law, but before that, we need a level playing field. <clears throat> and just lastly, close proximity missions, a fascinating, really important subject in orbit servicing, robotics, in, in, in service manufacturing, and active debris removal. So it's going to be a really important topic. And I've even seen in my children's papers, in um, first news papers, a big article um, at, on, on Astroscale's activities. Fantastic. But again, Fantastic opportunities, extending the life of existing assets, economic efficiencies, the removal of space debris, etc., bringing into use the spectrum filings, robotic and manufacturing in space, actually something that the UK could really lead on. But there are larger issues of collision, liability, insurance, the issues of space debris, but real issues in national security. If you've got a camera in space, 
what's the difference between in orbit servicing and using a camera maybe to survey other satellites in the, in the close proximity and monetary concerns and a lot of international issues. We need to build up more international trust and confidence before um, close proximity missions are really going to come to the fore. Um, and this is what we don't want to happen. So for active debris uh, removal missions, the risk is potentially higher than for normal satellite missions. And what we would not want to happen is um, a conjunction of these two satellites, the host and, and, uh, and the in-orbit in, in service mission, colliding, causing more debris, and those fragments causing damage elsewhere. So just to, just to wrap up a few highlights of the journey, and then a uh, request to all of you. So I work long hours, but I feel lucky every day that I do something I love in an area that is blossoming. There's so much potential in so many different areas. Um, I was involved, for example, when I first started out in the privatization of Inmarsat, uh, taking an intergovernmental agency and converting it into a commercial agency. And, and, and that, that was incredible. Uh, I was a lawyer, very lucky to be a lawyer for human spaceflight and space debris at ESA. And, uh, and as a woman in charge of the, the human spaceflight of the lawyer and a Brit, it was quite unusual because at that time the UK did not invest in human spaceflight and I felt incredibly privileged uh, in that regard. I remember in February in 2009 sitting up listening to World Service at about 2 a.m. Don't ask me why I was up at 2 a.m. But... Um, Cosmos 2251 and Iridium 33 um, had conjoined, they had collided. And I thought, wow, for the first time we're going to actually test the liability convention. Now, I was lucky enough to be acting for Iridium at that time and we didn't test the liability convention. That was right uh, not to do that. But that was really interesting, looking at the dynamics of uh, the defunct Cosmos satellite and the active communication Iridium satellite. Um, more recently, um, drafted a report, we call it the, the Lego Guide, um, for everything you need to set up a spaceport for a spaceport formula, and they were excellent to work with, and we really did cover everything in the space of the year, um, from, from range, to spaceport, launch, spectrum, everything, and there's so much potential in the UK for this. As I mentioned, very lucky to represent ESA and the UK uh, government at Uncopulous. We've changed insurance policy twice in the UK. We're looking for a third time to really help small satellites and small launches in the UK. We've upgraded the SFN hugely to try and help UK companies across COVID. It's not been easy. Let's be really blunt. It's not been easy. We've seen some companies go up and some companies come down. Um, we set up the Athena project. So we looked at areas of industry where there were less than 10% of women working. For example, the two amazing women satellite operators in Inmarsat, some of the fantastic engineers at uh, Airbus. And we asked for the help of an FT journalist and a professional photographer. And we took a photo of the women, wrote up about their, their stories and turned it into a book and, uh, and took it into schools. And it was fantastic. And uh, the, the impact on the women and the schools was, was great. We've also done something quite strange is we've noticed that there were women in some operators and manufacturers around the world where there are very, very few women in the whole, whole company. Uh, I'm talking about particularly in the Middle East. And we've gone to the board of the companies and said, send, send this lady over to us for a few weeks and let us give her work experience. So we had a fantastic lady called Fatima who came to work with us for two weeks. She was only one of two women in the whole company who was not a cleaner. And um, I think, I hope we opened her eyes. She came with chaperones, et cetera, but she came and she was excellent. Um, we sponsored schools for the CANSAT competition. And um, and we just in the last month, which means a huge amount to me, set up the Olden Foundation. And we've heard a lot about these four words uh, over the last few days, engage, insight, inspire, and skills. And uh, that's our Olden Foundation's book into those four areas. And in regard to inspire, we go out to schools, we have done for about five years now, go out to schools and actually uh, teach girls and boys what, what space means to them. And uh, this has me meant the destruction of several main school halls and several school gardens. It's been fantastic. And to teach particularly girls how to make a water rocket 
to build something themselves, see the dynamics of it, and it's brilliant. And I'm very, very proud that across South London, there are still a lot of water rockets stuck in trees, and the roofs are very many schools, so it's, it's fantastic. And lastly, my last slide, I want to ask everyone listening today, a big favor, I want you all to do something today, and this is really important. I want you to think about Amy Johnston who was one of the most influential, impressive, inspirational women of last century. The first woman to fly solely from England to Australia. String up other records. Yes, she had a pretty tough time, a lot of hardships, but she got on with it. But when she was asked, you know, what makes you tick? How did she manage to achieve this? Often she would say that the engine was wonderful. She would defer and deflect a lot of the credibility away from her giving others or the machines credit. So I want you all to stop and just today think about where you are and give yourself credit for where you are and what you're going to be. Please give yourself credit. Women are very good at deflecting the credit and praising other people, but please give yourself credit today. And then moving forward, I just ask you all to take opportunities, push yourself, do your homework, go get it and don't leave it to others. A friend of mine is, um, is now the head of regulatory at a big satellite operator, but a few years ago, the CEO of that operator contacted me to help him find um, heads of regulatory for that, that company, and I reached out to her. And a few weeks after that, I reached out, she phoned me up in the evening and said, I've got into the final round, it's me and three, three men, but I can't do it. Why not? Why can't you do it? And she's because they're men and they're going to fit. It's all male board, etc. And I just asked her one question: in one in one year's time, if I phone you up and say, "Why did you not take this? Because you know you can do a better job than these three men." How would you feel if you know that you can do a better job than them and you didn't take that? She took the job and she's done really well. And please support everyone. That also means supporting the men, because if you support the men, you, the men also support the women. Work hard, learn, be courageous, have grit and determination, and above all, keep going. Really important, but also really, really important. Stay human, collaborate, include, and build water rockets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neha. Thank you so much. What an inspiring talk, Joanne. It was refreshing to hear the importance of space law policies and their importance in the space sector. Considering we have only five so minutes, I will be helping you with a few Q&A sessions. So, um, Yubit asks, can you discuss space law warfare and in general, just and unjust space warfare? Sorry, space warfare? Yes. So, um, that, that's, a, that's a PhD thesis. So the space is there for peaceful uses, but let's be honest, um, when I was at Uncopuous, we, we sat and agreed um, rules, rules of the road for sustainable and peaceful uses. Before the next Copuous event, the Chinese had launched the ASAP mission, causing one of the biggest debris clouds ever. Um, but it was, uh, the issue was that in Copuous, we were speaking to one part of the government, and one part of the uh, of, 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 of the agencies. It's very, very hard to control. There are clearly in-orbit servicing can also be classed as an act of aggression. It is illegal under um, Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty to put uh, weapons of mass destruction in space, but it does not pre prevent military activities and also defense activities. Um, um, and I'm sure there might be other questions, so I'll leave it there, but that's a big topic and I'm happy to, to take that offline for you. So, Alison asks, what consequences are in place for any violation of space law? It seems that accountability can be a challenge when it comes to international policy. Accountability is a huge area, particularly in regard to um, harmful spectrum interference or the ASAP mission I mentioned or the Cosmos Iridium issue. A lot of it is pure um, gentlemen's agreements at the moment with very little repercussions. Um, this has been discussed recently at UN, but we need the UN to have a little bit more teeth and we need to have real implications. Um, one area that I've looked at in this is link um, a race to the top form of licensing. So really Belt and Brace is really strong licensing linked to investment. 
Um, so you're inspiring and incentivizing companies to do the right thing. If they do the right thing, they get a license and they get in, um, um, in investment. But it's very hard at the moment internationally because it's lack of teeth. Right. Um, so we have we've got a minute left. Um, so you can answer the rest of the questions. I would really love it if you could take a and ask the rest of the questions um, in the chat. It was a pleasure having you, Joanne, and I really loved listening to. I'm sure all the other attendees did as well. Thank you, Nate. So you're welcome. I will, so I will stay with you for the afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. And stay Bye, Joanne. Bye, bye.